But I wanted to start this morning um, by talking uh, politics. We had Winston Peters on recently and I asked him a question at the end of the interview, uh, uh, privately in a conversation afterwards, uh, we, we had a discussion about it. And the question was, as New Zealand First seems likely in the current environment to be above or certainly very, very close to the 5% threshold to get back into Parliament under MMP, I did ask the question of Winston Peters, given that he had put Jacinda Ardern, some would say, in power, whether or not he would deal with Labour again. His answer was ambiguous. And that sparked from you people and on social media quite a lot of comment, much of it not positive about Winston Peters, much of it saying, oh, we're not going to fall for that again. I was then, well, not surprised... Um, but I thought it was worthwhile and fair to Mr Peters for us to highlight a speech he gave at the Walkworth Town Hall over the weekend, a kind of campaign launch speech, a kind of scene-setting speech, and I want to quote from the end of that speech. And that speech said, We oppose co-governance. We support policies based on need, not race. We support the right of New Zealanders to disagree with government policy and not be punished for it. And we are never going to work in Parliament with any political party whose policies threaten these fundamental rights. That's a strong and that's an unambiguous statement. And Winston Peters, the leader of New Zealand First, joins us now. Uh, Winston, welcome to the programme. Thank you for, uh, for coming on this morning. Good morning. Um, I think, and I've been doing this a while, that that is code for as long as Labor is into co-governance, into its interp current interpretation of the treaty, should New Zealand first return to Parliament, we will not entertain a coalition deal with them. Well, just get one thing straight. We didn't put Jacinda Ardern into power all by herself in 2020, but the reality is that in the speech that I made and walk with, and it uh, was a prescriptive speech. And if you read it very clearly, here's my exact and short answer. Labor has ruled themselves out with these racist policies. Well, Winston, you would understand then that this breaks with your tradition of saying, I will or will decide, the caucus will decide after an election who we'll, we'll go with, and you've been criticised for that, and it has also, in a political sense, worked for you. Would you accept that this, in terms of uh, your positioning strategy prior to a campaign or prior to polling day, is a break from the past? It's a new no. strategy for you. No. I'll tell you why. This race-based separatist policy path down which New Zealand has gone was started, yes, by who? When John Key allowed uh, the Māori Party to go off to the United Nations and sign up to that declaration, uh, and when they started the super city, and don't laugh, and had a special Māori component, when you got rid of the foreshore and seabed bill and brought in their version of it under um, Chris uh, Finlayson, you were heading down the path then. And so I'm saying to every political party, there's one party in Parliament that's, that has, and its leader has for over 40 years, stood for one law for all. I'm against separatism, I'm against racism, and I'll do my best and my party will do its best to stop it. But it's a signal to every party. This is not the pathway down which we should go. Stop perverting the Treaty of Waitangi and saying what it wasn't. Stop taking the Lance case of 1987 and saying what it wasn't and start talking some truth on this matter. All right, but you would, you would agree, Winston, that at present the policies of co-governance and if you like, um, a partnership government based on supposedly these rather amorphous principles of the Treaty of Waitangi, that is Labor's thing at the moment. That is way more Labor policy than national policy. Well, sadly, again, we, we, these other parties haven't got a great track record on it. I mean, Rodney Hyde was the guy that did that for the Auckland Super City. What were they saying, for example, when they went off to the United Nations? What did they say about the foreshore seabed legislation, which we in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2005 fixed up? And then they, un they untangled that 
and started with something new because of Tatiana Turia's desire. We've got to get this thing really correct, and don't say it's some, something amorphous. I've seen the Treaty of Waitangi costing hundreds of millions of dollars to the taxpayers in terms of the university uh, lectures on this stuff, which is a bogus uh, and fake message, so to speak. Mm. And when I say bogus, let me, and it's in my speech, if nobody in the UK or the Commonwealth or the Empire at that time was in partnership with Queen Victoria on the 5th of February, 1840, how come the Maori were one day later on the 7th of February, 1840? after the Treaty of Waitangi was signed. That's what I've said, and I said it back then, and I said it in 1987, and I've never changed my message. I'm sorry this will be about me, but there's something I'm very strong on, because one thing I do know is, whilst this racist, separatist pathway has followed, the biggest victims will be the ordinary Maori, the people who will be advantaged will be a whole lot of um, fellow travellers, and the gravy train industry, and some elite Maori, and the country will be a disaster. That will be a disastrous outcome as well. So it's serious. Okay. I will ask you directly then, Mr Peters, on, and I'm going to ask you about various parties, on its current policy settings, and the Prime Minister has recently said that Māori are always walking across the bridge to partnership and it's time that Pākehā and the rest of New Zealand met them on that bridge. On its current policy settings and intentions... Given the views expressed in this speech, which, as you tell me, you've had for, for years and years and years. You know I have. Yeah. Would you or you, are you, you know on current Parliament. settings as of today, are you ruling out a coalition or a deal with the Labor Party if you were to return to Parliament after the next election? I'll say to you very slowly, given what I said on the weekend... The Labour Party, with their pursuit of racist policies, has ruled themselves out. All right. Which part don't you get? Okay, that's or all right. Part, all right, that's fine. That's, as, that's as close as I'm going to get this morning on that. I'll ask you the same question of National. On its current policy settings, um, would, Nash, would you look at the possibility of doing a deal with National or have they ruled themselves out too? Well, I don't know what Mr Luxon is saying on this matter. And what I do know is what their record is, which I think is disastrous. All right. What about uh, ACT? They'd seem quite close to you on that. Well, that's also a question of record. You see, the fact is we are never going to make it back to where we once were, a leading country in the first world, if we pursue these policies and don't get back to the fundamental basics. I said out in my speech what people want. They want decent, affordable housing. They want decent education. They want a health system. They want first world income. But we also need an economy that can do that. And oh, that's not a big aspiration. We were a world leading country not so long ago. And we've slipped away from that. So you're asking for all these questions a long way before the campaign even starts. And I know, yeah, I yeah. know what's behind uh, your mind. Mr. Peters, well, Winston, mind. I am not asking these questions out of uh, prurient interest or lightheartedness, these are the questions that New Zealand voters want an answer to, an unambiguous answer to. Yeah, but the first thing that New Zealand voters need to know is what is exactly going on, the insidious process that's going on in Parliament right now. I mean, this thing of partnership. Can you find any document between 2017 and 2020 has got partnership on it? No, you can't. But straight after the 2020 election, there it was. And I spent time saying that you're not come to ram down our throats. Nonsense. Historical twaddle, so to speak. It was never a partnership. This free clause document, the Treaty of Waitangi, was about equality. And mm. equality is one rule for everyone. Everybody equal in front of the law. And equality means exactly that. Not your separatist agenda where some people are privileged because of an ethnic background. And by the way, I set out the ethnic background itself where now you can claim all these things because you've got one part Māori and 512. And whilst all this humbug is going on, the ordinary Māori is suffering dramatically. OK. So it sounds to me the best I'm going to get out of you in terms of a definitive answer this morning, Mr Peter, is, is that at present the Labor Party rules it out itself out of a hypothetical future coalition deal with New Zealand First and the jury is out on National because you're not quite sure what they stand for yet. Uh, look, you, you, what you're asking me to, uh, to answer is uh, unfold because you've got some preordained wisdom 
Everything is no, no, because you gave a speech, Mr. Mr. Peters, which Sean, created an impression. Sean, let me explain to your viewers that you're asking me to advise without knowing what the next 15 months may hold. I don't know what Nationals policies on these issues are, but it's got us very, very troubled background on them. I've laid them out. Now, my point is, are we going to go forward as one people with all our different backgrounds or are going to be some sort of part hide part policy to division? Mm. I need to know. And we don't know what's going to unfold. All right. Um, look, and I do realise it's before the courts and I do realise that you weren't a party to it. I see the Crown has appealed the New Zealand First Foundation case in very general terms. Would you have any comment on that? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Now, it's sub to say, so I've avoided talking to your other media colleagues on this matter, except I'll say one thing. Isn't it extraordinary that they're talking about appealing this case, excepting the government has found $10 million to, quotes fix up the loophole can you see something inconsistent here? If there's a loophole, why is there appeal? Mm. And how that's the real issue. Uh, something dramatically, seriously in politics is going wrong. Mm. Look, I'd also like your comment on, on the issue that has got a, a lot of press gallery journalists and, and political insiders uh, incredibly excited. I, I don't quite share their view, and that is uh, Dr Sharma's fallout with uh, the Labor Party. He is likely to be expelled from the Labor caucus today, and my understanding is then he becomes an independent MP. I saw your colleague Shane Jones making rather supportive comments about him. Um, would you offer to have uh, someone like Dr Sharma join your party? There might be some advantages by having an incumbent MP on the, on the ticket come next election. <laughs> Uh, Sean, when uh, I get to control what goes on the platform, you get to control what goes on in New Zealand first, all right? Now, the second thing I want to say is I don't know much about Mr Sharma other than I followed the narrative. I know that he's not being supported by a lot of New Zealanders because I think somebody should just shut up. But what's going on here is an awful deceit. It's as transparent. The Prime Minister is not being honest about this. She says, for example, that the natural process of justice. He's got no natural process of justice. And they, he went to a meeting, uh, he was meant to be at a caucus last Tuesday, a week ago, not knowing that the day before, in the evening, they'd had a private meeting about it. Well, the problem was this he is, did know. He did know there'd been the, the meeting the night before, didn't he? No, 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 he didn't know, sorry. He did know after the event. Yeah. He didn't know before the event. And so, see, remember the old saying, look, we're going to hang him in the morning, but before that we'll give him a trial. This yeah. is disgraceful. Yeah. And then the official, official Information Act uh, b business. Look, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Prime Minister, you're being found out. This is deceitful. This is not balanced and it's not fair. And he won't be the only one. And I've read too much of what he said to know there's a whole lot more involved as well. Yeah, but you also understand as a party leader and you've had your troubles with the, the tight five and others, uh, Winston, that discipline in a caucus and being a team player is important. Oh, yeah, I agree. But that, look, look, this is a true story. It's a fact. And it happened to me because I was being expelled from the National Party. And one guy with all the, um, you know, criticisms made of him got up and said, this is a serious, serious mistake. And his name was Rob Muldoon and how right he was because Muldoon had the view. Were you, bullied? You, were were you bullied by the National Party, Winston? Uh, you know something, no one bullies me, <laughs> not even Sean Funker. <laughs> the reality is, the reality is I didn't leave the National Party, they left me. They abandoned their policies. Yeah. Can I just remind you what's happened here? And Sharma has got a, a, certain, a certain historic significance about it. Between 1990 and 1993, with the policies that National followed, which we didn't campaign on, we went from the biggest majority possible in Parliament to a hung parliament in three years. Mm. That tells you we weren't keeping our word. Mm. And Mr. Sharma's case, Mr. Sharma is going to get the boot today. This is a, you know, this is a, this is a uh, kangaroo court, as he says. Uh, but there'll be other, many other disgruntled ones. And the second thing is, uh, there's the Francis report of 2019. 
the Labour Party didn't come out of it very well at all. Mm. They've learned nothing from it. All right, then, uh, he is gone. Would you, if he came to you and said, look, uh, I still want to be in politics, I like New Zealand First, can I join you guys and be a New Zealand First MP? Would you be happy with that? Would you welcome him with open arms? Look, I love the intriguing way you ask these questions, and you know full well that I'm never going to answer that because it's you not had my conversa- OK, I'll ask you a straight question. Has anyone in New Zealand First had a conversation with him? I don't know, but I haven't, and okay. no one has told me they have. But right. I can't rule it out because I don't know the answer. All right. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, you know what they say about these, some of these politicians? I no. don't answer the question until I get to the bridge, but they'll double cross that bridge when they come to it. We don't do that. <laughs> and on the wider issue, so you're telling me on current policy settings, Labor have ruled themselves out of doing a coalition deal with with New Zealand First if you were to get in at the next election and you simply do not know or cannot figure out what Nationals' position are on these issues yet. So the jury's out on them. Can I just say something more serious than that? And that is this. When you uh, talk to people in coalition negotiations uh, and they lay down their uh, plan and what their long-term structure is that you're going mm. to agree with, if they deceive you or let you down or betray you, yeah, you're never going to change your mind about what happened here. If we'd have ever known that the pathway of separatism, apartheid and racism and racial preference was where Labor wanted to go, you'd have never heard of Jacinda Ardern or any of those ministers mm. in 2017, 18 and 19. Mm. Uh, Winston, I, I am loath to mention private conversations because it's the rule of my journalism. But are you alluding to a conversation you had with me about Jacinda Ardern regarding Ihamato and the fact that you will not deal with someone who you feel has crossed or betrayed you? Is Jacinda Ardern such a person? Well, I thought I was having a private conversation with well, you. Well, that's what I'm saying. I, 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 well, I'm sure I'm sure you've got ethics. Yeah. I'm having a private conversation with you and now you've said it publicly, but now that you have, let me tell you, Ihamato was commissioned without me ever knowing I was Deputy mm. Prime Minister. Mm. Imata came in and was never told to me or advised to me and I was a Deputy Prime Minister and Coalition Partner. And here's the real rub. When it was disclosed, the Prime Minister claimed she didn't know anything about it, to which I said, this is after the 2020 election, too late for me to do anything about it. Mm. I said, so are you going to sack Minister Mahuta? Because what you're saying is if you didn't know, m- m- Minister Mahuta didn't tell you, so she should mm. be sacked. And in her failure to act then, we all know what the truth is. And you're right. Nobody gets to lie to me like that. Twice. I hear you. Um, any thoughts on the protest today at Parliament? Well, it's sad. I funny you should say that because, you know, people have got the right to protest. And it's endemic and it's essential in democracy. And I just hope they behave themselves because there was a time when protests outside of Parliament, it was a feature we all not look forward to, because usually it was against the government, yeah. but it was of interest, and all of a sudden it's become malignant and dangerous, and that's got to be stamped out. Mm. People have got a right to protest, but they've not got a right to break the law. And I hope today uh, is an example of them learning that lesson. Good on you, Winston. I thank you, as always, uh, uh, for your time uh, this morning. That is the uh, leader of New Zealand First, Winston Peters. Well, I did my best. Did we get an answer? I don't know. I'll leave that up to you.